So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Hawk, and I am the Shorebird Data Quality Manager for the Shorebird Program at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. First off, thank you to each surveyor here for your interest in monitoring shorebirds and seabirds. Florida's extensive shorebird monitoring program is only possible because of the dedication of people like you. Your monitoring efforts help us locate nests and chicks so we can protect them, identify threats so that we can manage them, and detect trends in populations so we can better track local species. So once again, on behalf of all shorebirds and seabirds that nest in Florida, thank you for your participation. We have two main goals to cover today. Um, the first is to learn how to monitor shorebirds and seabirds using our standardized protocol. This is the breeding bird protocol of Florida's seabirds and shorebirds, which I'll refer to as either the protocol or the BBP during this presentation. Our second goal is to learn how to enter monitoring data into the Florida shorebird database, which I'll call either the database or the FSD. The FSD is our online database where you will be entering the data you collect. It is the repository that tracks nesting shorebird and seabird data in Florida. But before you start monitoring and before we even discuss how to monitor, I want to remind you all that it is important to connect with your local Florida Shorebird Alliance partnership. For those brand new to shorebird monitoring, the Florida Shorebird Alliance, um, also called FSA, is the statewide network of local partnerships committed to advancing shorebird and seabird conservation here in Florida. Your local partnership coordinators can help direct you to the areas that need additional monitors. Some locations may already have adequate coverage. They can also connect you with other monitors that you can shadow as you develop your shorebird monitoring skills, and they can point you to lo important local resources that are available. If you are unsure what partnership you are in or who to contact, you can visit the FSA's website and check out the partnership tab to explore the different partnership pages and find contact information for each partnership coordinator. You can also contact the Florida Shorebird Alliance coordinator, Shay Armstrong at shorebird at myfwc.com. The FSD and the FSA websites are two great resources to visit for additional training materials, identification guides, annual reports, and video tutorials, which will include a recording of this webinar. The Green Bird Protocol provides standardized methods for data collection. When data is collected the same way across the whole state, we can track population status and trends. These data are used to inform management decisions both locally and statewide. A link to the protocol was emailed to you prior to the webinar and can also be found on the FSD website under the resource tab. Feel free to have a copy open as we continue. So what are we monitoring? What data are we actually collecting? The, pro the protocol provides instructions on how to monitor shorebird and seabirds. Their breeding populations, so these are counts of adult breeding birds, their nesting, chick rearing, and staging locations, um, any nest outcomes, so whether or not a nest has successfully hatched, as well as any threats or disturbances that may be present. And this could be from predation pressures, anthropogenic causes, or anything else that threatens successful nesting. Seabirds and shorebirds are two biologically distinct groups of beach nesting birds found along our coast and in some inland areas. For our purposes, the most important difference between seabirds and shorebirds are their nesting strategies. Seabirds nest together in groups called colonies. They bank on safety in numbers. A single colony will typically be comprised of multiple breeding pairs and contain one or more seabird species nesting together. The size of a colony will vary depending on the species, the location, and habitat composition. Because they nest in groups, colonies tend to be fairly obvious. The adults are loud and will actively defend their colony by taking turns dive bombing intruders. Their chicks tend to remain within or close to the colony as they are dependent on their parents to feed them. And even after becoming flight capable, seabird young tend to hang out near colonies until the nesting season ends and all the adults disperse. 
<laughs> in contrast, shorebirds are solitary nesters. A pair of shorebirds will typically choose to nest away from other shorebirds and rely on camouflage for safety. Due to their secretive nesting behavior, shorebird nests are more difficult to locate. Often the best way to locate a cryptic shorebird nest is to patiently observe the adult's behavior, which can take a bit of practice. Shorebird chicks are precocial, they are highly mobile, and are often out of the nest within hours of hatching and can even move miles away from their natal nest. There are, of course, exceptions. Some shorebirds choose to nest in seabird colonies, and sometimes seabirds choose to nest individually. While seabirds and shorebirds are two distinct groups of birds, we sometimes refer to both groups collectively as shorebirds. For example, in the name of our database, the Florida Shorebird Database. There are 20 species of seabirds and shorebirds that nest throughout Florida. Not all of these species nest statewide. For example, three of these species, the mass booby, brown nudie, and Magnus Fitzen frigate bird, only nest in the dry tortugas. It is unlikely that you will observe all of these birds nesting where you are surveying, but we still ask that you pay attention for all the species listed here, as you never know when birds will decide to try something new and unusual. Focus your efforts specifically on monitoring the 12 species in bold. These are the species you are most likely to see if you conduct a coastal route survey and include species that are state-threatened. These birds include the black skimmer, brown nudie, caspian tern, gull-billed tern, laughing gull, least tern, roseate tern, royal tern, sandwich tern, American oyster catcher, snowy plover, and last but not least, Wilson's plover. If you'd like to learn more about state threatened species plans and species action plans in Florida, you can go to myfwc.com. These four state listed shorebirds pictured here breed in Florida. Clockwise from the top left, we have the American oyster catcher, the snowy plover, the black skimmer, and the least tern. Shorebird breeding season typically starts in March and goes through the end of August. Depending on species, weather, and where you are surveying in the state, you may save birds on nest as early as February, or even tending to unfledged young as late as October. The breeding bird protocol designates six count windows, which are week-long surveying windows from March to August. Count window dates um, are the same each year. And at a minimum, we ask FSA partners, that's all of you, to commit to surveying during each count window. Surveying during these monthly count windows provides us with a statewide snapshot of breeding activity and limits the chance of double counting birds moving between areas in the state. We recommend surveying weekly once nests are observed where you are surveying. Weekly surveys provide a better estimate of peak counts and and increases our understanding of nest outcomes and causes of nest failure. For example, let's say I survey a, a nest, an active nest during the May count window. The next time I survey is during the June count window and I find that the nest is no longer present. There may not be enough evidence to determine what happened to the nest. Perhaps it hatched and the adults moved the chicks out of the area, or maybe it was predated and the adults abandoned the area. If I check the nest weekly, I have a better chance of determining the outcome of the nest because the signs of what happened, such as tracks or broken eggshells, could still be present. Everything making sense so far? Any questions? You can either raise your, the hand icon or type in the chat box. Um, and then we're going to move on to discussing a few key terms from the breeding bird protocol and how to fill out your data sheets. Um, feel free to have the protocol open and ask any questions you have about it. All right, we have a question in the comments. Uh, we are asked, we want data on foraging, loafing with no breeding activity or only breeding behavior. That is a good question. Um, the database is set up just for breeding activity. You can record 
foraging our loafing birds in the comments. And we'll get into that uh, when we get into the data sheets. Um, but for generally, it's bird breeding behavior. There are a handful of key, key concepts you'll need to understand before you start surveying. These are defined in the breeding bird protocol on pages four and five. We will discuss each concept first and then put them together for what a theoretical survey trip might look like. We'll go into more detail about what data is collected for each when discussing data sheets. First off, a route is the path that you survey in search of breeding birds. Routes have a designated start and end point and should be short enough to survey in a single outing. In the database, routes are represented as a line accompanied by a purple diamond as pictured on the map. Most routes will be land-based, typically covering beaches, but there are some breeding habitats that can only be surveyed by boat, so you will see some water-based routes. There are likely already designated routes in your area. Using the same route every time you survey an area helps us better understand how the birds are using the habitat and how that use changes during the breeding season and over the years. Remember to connect with your local partnership to find out which routes are available to survey. When you survey a route, you are conducting a route survey. A route survey is each individual time that you visit a route to look for breeding birds and ideally covers the entire route from start to end point. Route surveys should occur at least monthly during each count window and then weekly, if possible, once nests are observed on the route. A site is the physical location of where birds are nesting. Remember that seabirds and shorebirds have different nesting strategies. This is reflected in how we collect the data. Shorebirds typically nest individually, so each shorebird nest is considered a site. Seabirds typically nest together in colonies, so each individual colony is considered a site. Like routes, sites are geographical locations. In our database, solitary shorebird nest sites are represented by a yellow diamond, and seabird colonies are represented by a blue diamond. Because seabird colonies cover an area as, as opposed to a single point like solitary nest, the database also uses green polygons to represent the colony footprint as pictured on the map. A site visit is when you check on a site, either a colony or a solitary nest. Site visits to a site should occur on every route survey from the time a site is discovered until the birds are no longer actively using the nest or colony. For solitary nests, this means that the breeding pair are no longer tending to the nest. And for colonies, this means that all chicks and breeding adults have left the colony. A roving chick observation is the physical location where shorebird chicks are observed outside of the nest. We mentioned earlier that shorebird chicks are precocial and leave the nest shortly after hatching. A staging young observation is the physical location where flight capable seabird chicks are observed away from a colony. Seabird young are dependent on their parents for food even after they fledge. They rarely stray from the colony before fledging. Unlike routes and sites, these observations are sorry, like routes and sites, these observations are geographical locations. But unlike routes and sites, these locations are transient, representing where chicks were observed at that moment in time. So they are not considered sites and thus do not have site visits. In the database, both roving chick and staging young observations are represented as yellow circle circles as pictured on the map. We did skip forward a bit in the protocol. Roving chick and staging young are mentioned throughout the protocol, which is why I'm bringing up now, but they are specifically on, addressed on page 15. So let's pull all of these concepts we just talked about together and walk through what a potential route survey might look like. You start by choosing the route that you'd like to survey that meets the needs of your local partnership. You visit that route during a monthly count window or more frequently if you're able to, especially when nesting has begun. You conduct a route survey starting at the beginning of the route. 
And as you survey the route, you see and hear a group of black skimmers and least terns on the beach. You stop to observe them and see that both species are nesting together. This is a mixed species colony site. You will collect data for the site since it is the first time you documented the colony here, and you will also conduct a site visit. We will cover what data you are collecting when we go over data sheets. If you had documented this colony on a previous route survey, you would only need to conduct a site visit. After collecting the appropriate data, you continue surveying the route. You observe a Wilson's plover incubating eggs. This is considered a solitary site. You collect data for this site and then continue and then continue to conduct a site visit. After that, you continue down the route a little further and you observe a young killdeer with its parents foraging along the shoreline. This is a roving chick observation. You collect data for this observation and then continue surveying. When you near the end of the the route, you observe a group of black skimmers that are flight capable, still being fed by their parents. They are well away from the colony site, so you report this as a staging young observation. You collect data for this observation and then continue to the end point. The route survey ends at the point at the route endpoint. Sometimes you may conduct a route survey and not see any sites, roving chicks, staging young may not see any breeding adults or chicks at all. This data is still really important to collect and is sometimes referred to as null or zero data. It's important because it tells us where birds are not breeding. Let's go over some basic monitoring etiquette. These are a few things to keep in mind while surveying to keep both you and the birds safe. You want to avoid disturbing the birds as much as possible. If a bird changes their behavior in response to you, such as giving a broken wing display, alarm calls, flushing, dive bombing you, et cetera, um, you're gonna need to back up. You're too close to their nest or chicks. The birds are telling you they want, they want you to back up and give them space so they can properly care for their nests and chicks. Also be aware of any potential predators nearby Flushing birds from their nest or from their chicks when predators are present uh, could result in predation. Also, do not enter posted areas. These are areas that have keep out or do not enter signs or symbolic fencing. Um, we ask that you not access these areas. You do need a permit from FWC um, to be able to enter into these areas. If you see a nest or a colony that is not posted, it is likely the land manager doesn't know about it. Alert landowners and managers about any new sites you find so they can post the area to keep people from disturbing the birds. And if you're not sure who the land manager or landowner is, you can contact FWC staff. Your regional shorebird biologist is a great resource and can and you can find their contact information on the FSD website underneath the help tab. We can break down monitoring ground nesting shorebirds and seabirds into three basic steps. Conducting a route survey, documenting any nests, colonies, and chicks or young observed on your route, and lastly, entering all this data into our online database at www.fl shorebirddatabase.org. To aid in data collection, we provide four data sheets. These can be found at the end of the breeding bird protocol on pages 20 through 23, as well as on the FSD's website under the resource tab. The route form will be filled out under step one and the other three forms are all used under step two. So let's start with step one, conduct a route survey. Every time you conduct a route survey, you will complete a route form, even if you are not able to finish surveying the entire route or you do not observe any breeding birds, chicks, or young. When filling out a route form, you will record the name of the route, the name of the observers that participated in the route survey, the date and the start and end times of the survey, how you surveyed the walk, did you how you surveyed the route. Did you walk, use an ATV, boats? Um, did you survey the entire route? Did you conduct a 
partial route survey, meaning you are only able to survey a section of the route. You may not be able to survey a route entirely every time you go out. Storms, time restrictions, tides, etc., may cause you to have to cut a survey short from time to time. You'll also be collecting additional adult counts, additional breeding adult counts on route, more on these counts later, and you can report any particular comments or unusual things that you saw on your route. These could be unusual behaviors um, or banded birds that you might see. To help keep you organized, there is also an option to use the site checklist at the bottom. You can use this space to keep track of what known sites are on your route and if you visited them during the route survey. Additional breeding adults are one of the fields that you're going to fill out in the route survey, and these are defined in the breeding bird protocol on page seven as birds that were not counted at a nest site or with chicks. Be sure to only count birds that are breeding on the route that you are surveying as additional breeding adults. So this will include birds that are likely to nest this season, so territorial pairs or birds exhibiting other breeding behaviors. Birds that currently have nests or chicks on your route but were not observed with them. And birds that had a nest or chicks that already failed this season. We are only asking to collect additional breeding adult counts for three focal shorebird species. Um, that's the American oyster catcher pictured on the top, snowy plover pictured middle, and Wilson's plover pictured at the bottom. Telling us how many additional breeding adults were observed on your route that were not with a nest site or chicks helps us calculate the total breeding populations for these species. Not all adult shorebirds you observe on your route will be counted as additional breeding adults. The additional breeding adult count is not a count of all birds seen on your route, just those that are actually breeding on the route, but were not observed with their nest or chicks. So birds that are excluded from this count include Birds at nests or with chicks, these adults do not get counted as additional breeding adults as they are counted on the solitary nest visit or roving chick observation, which we'll cover shortly. Um, also not counted are breeding adults from other routes or rooftops. Sometimes breeding birds that are nesting nearby but not on your route that you are currently surveying will visit your route. They don't get counted as additional adults on your route, but they do get counted on the route survey that they are breeding on. Behavior should give these birds away. These will be single birds or pairs loafing or foraging together along a route, but they're not going to be displaying any nesting behavior or have a nest on your route. They'll likely be observed at different locations on the route, either on the same survey or on subsequent surveys. Non-breeding birds are also not counted as additional adults. These include birds that are too young to breed and breeding age adults that are not breeding during the season. This could be because they're migrants, uh, they weren't able to find a mate, or they weren't able to establish a territory or something like that. These, mer these birds may be alone or in small flocks and are not defending territories or exhibiting other nesting behaviors. Birds that are known to be non-breeders or are likely non-breeders should not be counted as additional breeding adults on your route because they are not actively breeding during the season. Note that for some species, plumage is not a reliable indicator that a bird is breeding. For example, American oyster catchers do not breed until they are three to five years old, but can have full adult plumage before then. Behavior is going to be your best indicator to determine if a bird is breeding. Sometimes you're going to find a bird and you're going to have a hard time determining if it should be counted as an additional breeding adult on your route. If you're unsure, you can ask yourself a few questions about the bird. Are they by themselves or paired off? Have they been seen regularly in the same area on your route from survey to survey? Are they present on route during peak nesting season? Um, for oyster catchers, that's March 1st through June 24th. For snowy plovers, that's March 10th to June 19th. And for Wilson plovers, that's April 14th to June 24th. And the last question you can ask is, are they exhibiting breeding behaviors like actively defending territory, but no nest was found? 
We can answer yes to these questions, and these birds are likely nesting on your route and can be counted as additional breeding adults. Learning to identify additional breeding adults in your route takes time and patience. If you are brand new to surveying, it's helpful to shadow a more experienced shorebird monitor. Remember to reach out to your local partnership for guidance and additional resources. Let's continue using our example route from earlier. This route is called Amelia Island and was surveyed by two different observers on March 18th during the first monthly count window from 9 to 11. These observers surveyed the route by walking and were able to complete an entire route survey. They used tallies to keep track of additional breeding adults on route for a total of three oyster catchers, zero snowy plovers, and eight Wilson's plovers. They also saw a small group of oyster catchers roosting together, which they determined were non-breeding birds, so they did not include them as additional adults and instead recorded them in the comment section. Amelia Island is on the Atlantic coast where snowy plovers do not breed, so they will always report zero breeding adults for snowy plovers when they survey this route. If you are actively looking for additional breeding adults during your route survey, who do not see any, please record zero. Absent data is important too. It lets us know with certainty what areas birds are not using. Step two is documenting any nesting adults, chicks, or young observed on the route survey form using the shorebird nest form, the seabird colony form, and the roving chick staging young form. Let's start with shorebirds, page eight and nine in the protocol. Shorebirds nest individually, so each shorebird nest is a site and gets its own shorebird nest form pictured here. You will use the same data sheet to document a new site and to document a site visit. Each time you find a new site, you'll need to give the nest a unique name, report if it's a re-nest, and take a GPS point. When a breeding pair has previously attempted to nest during the current breeding season, then initiates another, another nest, that nest is considered a re-nest. The first nest a breeding pair has is often referred to as the original nest. And when you're taking GPS coordinates, a nearby point is okay. It's important to avoid flushing the birds from the nest. If you're worried about finding the site again, you can always use the comment section to note some landmarks or your position relative to the nest. Here's an example of a shorebird nest form documenting a newly found nest. The nest was given a unique name. I recommend using a naming convention that contains key information about the site. For instance, start with the location, AI for Amelia Island, the name of the route, then the species code, Whipple for Wilson's Plover, and then the nest number. For this example, the new nest is a re-nest, so that is also indicated in the name as well. The original nest for this pair was AI underscore Whipple 01, so the pair's first re-nest is named AI Whipple 01 R1, R1 for re-nest 1. Because this is a re-nest, check off the yes box and report the name of the original nest, record the GPS coordinates, and know if the site is posted. Remember to always alert land managers about new sites, especially if they have not been posted yet. You can learn more about Renest by checking out the Renest Quick Guide under the Resources tab of the FSD. This guidance document can help you determine whether a site is a Renest, even if you don't have banded birds. After documenting the new nest site, you will need to complete a site visit. You will do a site visit for any shorebird nest sites seen during a route survey. Each time you conduct a site visit, you'll record the status of the nest and the final outcome if the nest has ended, the species, the nesting behavior exhibited by the adults, if one or both of the adults are present, as well as the egg and nestling counts if they are visible, and any relevant comments um, that you might have, like if the adults were banded. 
You can also report potential threats and disturbances in the optional information section. The shorebird nest form has three status categories, probable nesting, active, and no longer active. Probable nesting is for cases where you strongly suspect that there is a nest nearby, but you don't want to disturb the birds to investigate. If you survey weekly or daily and you think you might have a chance of eventually spotting the nest, I'd advise waiting until you see the nest to add the site to the database. But if you only go in out to survey once a month or every couple weeks, or the habitat makes it unlikely that you will see the nest, then you can add it as a probable nest. Active means you saw the nest with viable eggs or nestlings, or saw an adult bird incubating or brooding, or the bird performed displays to draw you away from the area, like a broken wing display. No longer active is when the nest has ended and is no longer tended to by the adults. No viable eggs or chicks are in the nest cup. This could be because the eggs have hatched and chicks have left the nest, the nest was abandoned or destroyed, or the nest is gone and you're just not sure what happened. Detecting solitary shorebird nests is often best done by first watching a shorebird's behavior. If you see a bird incubating, brooding nestlings, or giving the broken wing display, it means a nest is present. Some birds are more cryptic. They may slink away from the nest to lure you away from the area. All three of these behaviors can re be reported as an active nest site. Pictured on the top on this slide is an example of an American oyster catcher incubating eggs. Middle is a snowy plover brooding nestlings in the nest cup. And bottom is a picture of a Wilson's plover performing a broken wing display. Also note, don't confuse a bird brooding nestlings with a bird brooding roving chicks. When a bird is brooding nestlings, they are at the nest site, and it's likely that one or more of the eggs are still hatching. When an adult is brooding roving chicks, they are not at a nest site and are documented using the roving chick and staging young form. In our example shorebird nest form, a breeding pair of Wilson's plovers were observed acting like they had a nest, but the nest itself was not visually confirmed. The adults were slinking down the beach trying to draw attention away from the area where AI Whipple 01R1 was found. This behavior is a good indicator that there is a nest nearby. Thus, the nest status is reported as probable nesting on the data sheet. In the count section, record the number of species, two Wilson's plover adults, and the egg and nest counts are left blank as no nest was observed. Another example where you would report the nest status as probable nesting is if a pair is in a large closed area, like a posted colony, where you're unable to get a good view to see a nest, but parental behavior strongly suggests that a nest is present. Let's say the same nest is checked on a week later. This time the same pair is seen in the same area and one of the adults is in incubating posture. Take a new GPS point for the nest and make a note in the comments to notify FSB staff about the change of location for the nest site. Hang back from the nest and observe with binoculars. The birds are unbothered and after a few minutes, the incubating adults get off the nest revealing three eggs and zero nestlings. Record the nest status as active, the nesting behavior as incubating, and the counts as three eggs, zero nestlings, and two adults. If the nest is active, but you are unsure if eggs or nestlings are present in the nest cup, you can report unknown for both. If you know eggs or nestlings are in the nest cup but did not count them, you can report them as present. We want you to give us as much information as you can gather from a distance that is safe for the birds. It's okay to not collect some data if collecting it disturbs the birds. Let's say the same nest is checked a third time a few days later. This time, no adults are in the area and there are no eggs left in the nest. It's too soon for the eggs to have hatched and there are ghost crab tracks in and around the nest and a burrow right next to it. Record the nest status as no longer active, the final outcome as no eggs hatched, and document the evidence that crabs likely predated the nest. 
Once a nest is given a final outcome, you no longer have to visit the site during surveys. If the adults from this nest try to nest again, the new nest will be considered a re-nest. Shorebird chicks are highly mobile and may travel miles from their natal nest shortly after hatching. Any shorebird chicks observed outside of the nest are considered roving chicks and are documented using the roving chick staging young form. While it is not common, sometimes you may observe shorebird chicks that are still in the nest. These chicks are considered nestlings and are reported on the shorebird nest form. Here's an example of how to report a nestling on the shorebird nest form. In this example, one egg and one nestling were observed inside the nest cup with both adults nearby. The site status is marked as active and the count table includes one nestling found in the nest with one egg. Again, this is not a very common situation, but it is possible. If you find a shorebird roving chick, you will report it using the roving chick slash staging young form. To fill out this form, you will need to document the location of the chick or chicks, the habitat type they are using, the species, the number of adults and chicks present, the natal nest if known, and any relevant comments. Are these birds banding? Do they have any inter interesting interactions with each other? You can also use the bottom section to document any potential threats or disturbances. Both roving chicks and staging young are reported by chick age classes, downy, feathered, and flight capable. You can find this information on page 15 of the protocol. Downy chicks include chicks from newly hatched up to one and a half or two weeks old, depending on the species. They are covered in downy feathers and look very fuzzy. They're small and stay close to the parents. In the case of shorebird chicks, when recently hatched chicks are found in the nest bowl, they are reported as nestlings. As soon as the downy chicks leave the nest bowl, they are reported as a roving downy chick. You can see a picture of a downy chick of a least turn, I believe, pictured top. Um, the middle is a feathered chick and the bottom is a flight capable juvenile. Feathered chicks are about one and a half to three weeks old and have pin feathers. Uh, they may have some down, but overall more feathers than down, and they're bigger and more mobile than downy chicks. These chicks have scruffy appearance and are noticeably smaller than adults. Flight capable juveniles are capable of flight. They're about three to four weeks after hatching and they've learned how to fly and can fly in short bursts. As soon as they're able to do this, we count them as flight capable. These chicks are almost the same size as an adult at this point. So here's an example of a roving chick staging young form. There were three downy Wilson's clover chicks observed foraging on the beach with one adult. The observers recorded the species as Whipple, three downy chicks, zero feathered, and zero flight capable chicks. One adult recorded and the beach as the habitat type. In this case, the natal nest for these chicks is known and was reported. The, a natal nest is the nest from which the chicks hatched. You can only assign natal nest for shorebirds. We ask that you give us the natal nest name whenever possible and encourage you to assign a natal nest if you know the happenings of your route and you are relatively confident. This route is surveyed weekly and the observers know that even though there are many Wilson's plover nests in the area, there is only one nest that was near its hatch date. If you're able, please also fill out the optional information section at the bottom of the form. All site forms have this section and filling it out can help guide management and document pressures the birds are experiencing. In this example, there were dogs on the beach and wet rack present. We will come back to this form again when we talk about staging young, but first let's discuss colonies. You will fill out the seabird colony form anytime you survey a colony. Seabirds nest collectively in colonies that can be comprised of one or more species nesting together. This is pages 10 and 11 in the protocol. 
you will use the same data sheet to document a new colony site and a site colony visit. When you observe a new colony, you will need to give the colony a unique name and collect location data. Colonies cover an area, so you'll need to collect at least three GPS coordinates. Colonies may shift or grow or shrink in size over the breeding season, and if that happens, you can always collect new GPS coordinates to reflect those changes. In this example, a new mixed species colony was found on a route survey for Amelia's Island. The colony needs a unique name, so I recommend naming it the same way we talked about naming solitary nest sites, using a naming convention that conveys key information about the site. So for example, start with the location, Amelia Island, AI, then the species code, and here, since it's a mixed species colony, um, use just mixed colony instead of the species. And then the colony is given a number. So this colony was giving the name AI Mixed Colony 01. The colony may grow or shift over time, so you'll record three G GPS points for the location of the colony when you first discover it, and you may need to update those coordinates at a later time. Just like solitary nest sites, it's important to alert landowners and managers to new colonies, especially if they are not yet posted. After documenting the new colony site, we will need to complete a site visit. You will do a site visit for any seabird colony sites that are active and on your route. When conducting a, a site visit to a colony, you will need to record the status of the colony. If the colony is no longer active, you also need to report a final outcome. You'll report the counts of nests, chicks, and adults. If there is any major loss, if the site is posted, and if there's any comments, you can use the space to document any indifferent, additional information such as disturbance events or banded birds present in the colony. And again, there's that optional information section where you can report in more detail about disturbances and potential threats. The seabird colony form has two, two status categories, active and no longer active, which are similar to nest statuses for solitary nests. Active means you either saw at least one bird in the colony that was in incubating or brooding posture, or at least one chick is present in the colony. No longer active is when the colony has ended and there are no longer any nest or chicks left in the colony. A colony's outcome, final outcome will report if the colony was successful, so at least one flight-capable check was produced from the colony, or if the colony was unsuccessful and was abandoned or destroyed before, before producing any flight-capable young, or it will report that the colony is gone and you're not sure what happened. When conducting a seabird colony survey, you will be counting all nests, chicks and adults in or very near the colony. As mentioned earlier, you are unlikely to be able to see nests with eggs in it, so nests are counted by counting the number of adults in incubating posture. It is important that while counting colonies, you stay back a safe distance from the birds. You should be far enough away from the colony that the birds are not flushing or moving in, resp in response to your presence. When counting seabirds, we ask you to report the count type because it lets us know how you counted the birds, which gives us a sense of the accuracy for those numbers. There are four different count types for colonies, direct, extrapolated, presence, absence, and did not check. Count types are defined on pages 12 through 14 of the breeding bird protocol, and different survey conditions will dictate what count type you use. Whenever possible, you should conduct a direct count. Use when you're able to see and count everything in the colony. You can see all the nests, chicks, and adults. And the number you're reporting is the true actual number. You may need to move around to count the entire colony. Start with nests and count all the nests, including incubating adults, at least twice and report the average of your counts as the direct count for the nests. For larger colonies, it is good to have help. If you're counting a colony with other surveyors, each surveyor can count once and then report the average of everyone's count as the direct count. Repeat for chicks and then for total adults. 
Do not try to conduct multiple counts at the same time. In this example, I visited a colony and I was able to see and count the entire colony. On my first count of nests, I counted 50, and on my second count, 52. I report the average of these counts, 51, as my direct count for nests for this colony. If you are unable to conduct a direct count, try to conduct an extrapolated count. This is a less accurate count, but still provides good information on the size of the colony. Extrapolated counts are used when either your view of a colony is significantly obstructed, this may be due to vegetation or topography like dunes. It's just no matter what you do, where you move, you cannot see the whole colony. Or the colony is large and you do not have time to conduct a direct count for the entire colony. An extrapolated count is not a guess. It is a calculation based on the proportion of the colony where you can conduct a direct count. Let's walk through an example. The example colony pictured here has a large dune running through it, so it's not feasible to conduct a direct count because no vantage point or combination of vantage points allows you to view and count the entirety of the colony. Instead, you conduct an extrapolated count using the calculation protocol on page 13 of the breeding bird protocol. Step one, position yourself where you can see as much of the colony as possible. Step two, you delineate the viewable portion of the colony as your count area. In this example, you can see the portion of the colony shaded in light green. You cannot see the portion of the colony shaded in dark green. That's blocked by the dunes. You conduct a direct count of the nests in this viewable portion of the colony. Remember, a direct count is the average of two counts. So in this example, your direct count of nests in the viewable portion is 450. Step three, you determine approximately what percent of the entire colony your direct count area covers. Here you approximate that you counted 75% of the entire colony. Step four, now you divide your direct count by the proportion of the colony counted to get your extrapolated count. In this example, you divide 450 by 0 0.75 for a total of 600 nests. We have if this, if this number comes out as a decimal value, round up to the nearest whole number, and then repeat for chicks by age classes and for adults. If you don't have time for a direct count or an extrapolated count, you can report presence or absence. These count types at least let us know whether a colony is active in the area. It has limited utility for us, but at least lets us and other monitors on the route know that nests may have been present for different species. If you use present in lieu of a count, know that presence equals one. When we do any analysis, we are only able to say with any certainty, certainty that there was at least one. If you are time limited, please consider doing an extrapolated count, especially when counting adult birds. Marking absent indicates that you're able to verify that there were zero nests or chicks in the colonies. It is the same as reporting a direct count of zero. If you cannot confirm presence or absence, for example, a storm came through and you suspect chicks are still there and present, but they're being really good at hiding, you can report back did not check. There are additional count types used to monitor rooftops described in the breeding bird protocol and in the rooftop monitoring training webinar, which will be held this Thursday, March 9th from 1 to 2.30. Let's go back to fill out the seabird colony form for the newly found AI Mixed Colony 01. The site visit portion of the form looks and is similar to what we filled out for the shorebird nest form. This colony is mixed and has black skimmers and least terns nesting in it. I observe adults from both species in incubating posture, so I report the colony status as active. I report no for major loss since this is the first time I have observed this colony. 
Major loss is used to report when 25% or more of the colony is lost. So either a large number of chicks died or were lost, or, next, or nests failed between visits. A common cause for major loss is either a predation event or weather event. Um, weather events could cause overwash and knockout of big chunk of the colony. I can see the entire colony in this example. Nothing extracts my view, so I use a direct count to document nests, chicks, and adults. I report a direct count of 32 adults in incubating posture for black skimmer. There are no checks yet, so I report a direct count of zero for all three age classes. When I count adults, I count the total adults in the colony, including adults in incubating posture. Because of this, your adult count should almost always be greater than your nest count. I repeat this for least turns and get a count of eight nests, zero checks, and 24 adults. Let's talk about seabird chicks. As mentioned previously, seabird chicks are different from shorebird chicks in that they stay in or very near the colony for weeks after hatching. If seabird chicks are within sight of their active colony, they should be counted as part of the active colony on the seabird colony form. Seabird chicks of any age class can be documented as part of the seabird colony form. If you observe flight capable juveniles and they're not within sight of their colony, you can count them on a roving chick staging young form. This is the same form that we have already gone over for roving chicks. You can only report flight capable seabird chicks on this form. You cannot report downy or feathered chicks. Chicks this young should still be within the colony. Here's an example of a seabird colony with fledglings still within sight of the colony. This colony has adults and flight capable chicks, so the colony status is still active and counts are marked in their relevant columns. As soon as all flight capable chicks have left the colony, this colony will be marked no longer active with the final outcome of one or more flight capable juveniles were produced. If a group of flight capable young and adults are observed away from their colony, then use the roving chick staging young form. This is the same form we used when documenting roving chicks. Let's look at an example of documenting least turn young. A flock of flight capable juvenile least turns are well away from their colony or any least turn colony. You take a GPS location, and remembering not to get too close to these birds and record if the area is posted. Report the species and the total number of flight capable youngs and adult present with them. As this information was being recorded, an off-leash dog runs towards these birds, causing them to flush. And this is all documented in the optional information section. If you see banded birds on your route surveys, please document and report these observations. What you wanna record when you see a banded bird is the species of the bird, the color and position of any bands and flags on the bird's legs, if there are any codes on those bands or flags, an approximate GPS location, the date and time of the observation, and if possible, get a photograph. Visit the FSA's Banded Birds page to learn where to report banded birds. Who you report bands to varies by species and band combinations. The Banded Bird page can be found by going to the FSA's website and clicking on the Banded Birds link under the Resource tab. You can also find guidance on how to collect and record band information here. We do not currently have dedicated fields of the FSD to report banded birds, but you can always include this information in the comments. All right, before moving on to our last step, entering data, we're gonna stop for questions. Um, any questions about the data sheets or the data covered, uh, feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat. That covers, what we've talked about covers all the data that we're asking you to collect, and we'll be briefly going over how to enter data into the FSD next. All right, we have a really great question in the comment section. 
Um, what was asked is where is this data used? Does it go to the appropriate municipalities? Asking, especially if there are ongoing threats like dogs or bikes. So the FSD is an open resource to anybody that wants to look at that data, but specifically local, local um, municipalities, state, um, federal, um, can use this data to, to for management purposes. Um, a lot of the time, the people doing these surveys work in conjunction with FWC or state or other county level agencies um, and will report directly to them as well as entering it into the FSD. So it, some of those threats do get reported in real time, which is great if you are volunteering and you see threats. Um, I don't think I have that on the slide, but there is definitely information we can get to you about how to report that directly if it's an immediate issue that needs to be taken care of. It was a great question. Um, I'll have to get back to you on uh, the contact information for that though. Oh, we do have another question. Would the colony be mixed if one species is using the north end and the other is using the south end, but the only mixed species area is a very narrow edge? That is a great question. And sometimes that's going to be dependent on where you're surveying and what the birds are exactly doing. If you have colonies, typically what I advise is if you have birds within 300 feet of each other nesting, um, that you consider them the same colony for seabirds, obviously. Um, if they're pretty close to each other, I would just consider them as one colony. Um, if they're pretty far apart from each other, um, then you can consider them separate. And if you run into like any weird cases and you're not sure, you can always contact us at FL Shorebird Database at myfwc.com. Um, during the season and we can help answer any specific situations. All right, next question. What about the second species nest after you've already named the colony for the first species? Yes, that does happen. Sometimes you'll have black skimmers setting up and they'll just be there the entire time for several weeks and all of a sudden you go and visit and there's least turns. Um, and then you, you can document them still, both of those species within those site visits, the j name just isn't going to be able to be changed. So whatever you named it, um, it's still going to have that name, but you can still enter multiple species for it. The final step of monitoring shorebirds is entering your data online into the Florida Shorebird Database. We only have a limited amount of time to walk you through the basic steps, but you can always contact us anytime during the season with questions, and we are more than happy to help guide you through data entry. Again, birds can do some really weird things, and you might find yourself in a situation where you're like, I have no idea how to enter this data because it's weird looking. And if that's the case, you can always reach out to us, and we are happy to help you figure out the best way to get that data into the FSD. The first step in entering data is to create your own Florida Shorebird database account if you don't already have one. Once you create it, you can log in, and anytime you're using the FSD, it's best to use Google Chrome as your browser. If you can't remember your login information, don't have Google Chrome, or are having other issues with the database, you can email any of those questions to us at flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com. So after you log in, you will come to this page. This is your My Data page where you will be able to see all the routes, breeding sites, and rooftops that you monitor listed here. If you are new to the FSD, these boxes will be empty. All the data forms we went over today are entered into the database when you enter a route survey. But in order to enter a route survey, you will first need to add routes to your profile. Remember, lots of routes already exist in the database and multiple people could be surveying the same route. If you want to add a route to your profile, first check to see whether it already exists in the database. To do this, click on the blue Add Routes button. Search for a route either by FWC region or a county. The routes will appear in a list and on the map. 
select the route or routes you want to add to your profile by checking the checkbox next to the route name, then click Add to My Routes. The selected route or routes will appear on your profile on the My Grading Data page. If you are absolutely certain the route you surveyed doesn't already exist in the database, you can create a new route. To do this, click on the Create New Route button at the bottom of the page. This will bring you to the Establish a New Route page. You can create a new route by drawing the route on the map using either the capture click method or by entering a series of coordinates. Give your route a unique name and provide descriptive details like how to best access the route, where to park, where to start and end your survey, etc. And then click Submit and your new route will display in your My Routes box. Once you have added routes to your profile, they will appear in the My Routes box. Now you're ready to enter your route survey data. Click on the Add Survey button next to the route you want to enter a survey for. This will bring you to the Report Route Survey page, which is equivalent to the route form we talked about earlier. Enter the data about the route survey from your route form, and once you completed step one, the route form, you click on Continue to Step 2. Step two is where you enter information from the shorebird nest form, the seabird colony form, and the roving chick staging young forms. So use the add sites to routes button to enter any new sites that you found, and then click on the enter visit button next to each site to enter the site visit information. So after you've add sites to your route, they'll appear in that table um, with the enter visit button. Click on the Enter Roving Chick Staging Young button to enter any chick or young observations that you've had on your route survey. After entering all your site visits, roving chick observations, and staging young observations, remember to enter any additional breeding adults that you observed on your route. If you looked but did not see any, please report zero. If you are unable to look for, for additional breeding adults, click on the drop down menu to select did not count. Otherwise, just click on the field to enter a numeric count. After all your data has been entered, be sure to review your route survey to make sure all information has been entered correctly and is free of typos. If you need to edit any of the site visit information you entered, you can click on the relevant edit button when you are finished entering and reviewing your data, scroll to the bottom of the page and click the Submit Route Survey button to submit your route survey. If something comes up while you're doing data entry and you cannot finish entering all of your information, you can always scroll to the bottom and click on the Save and Finish Later button. The next time you log into the FSD, it will prompt you to finish data entry. If you want to view your route surveys, see the surveys that other monitors have entered for a route, or need to update any information on, on the route surveys you have already entered, you can click on the View Edit buttons in the My Routes box on your My Breeding Data page. So to sum up, there are four main steps to entering data in the FSD. Sign into your FSD account, Check for existing routes, or if a route does not exist, create a new route. Add a route survey, which includes entering route survey data, checking for existing sites, or creating new sites if they don't already exist. Reporting site visits for nests and colonies, and reporting chicks observations. And lastly, view or edit your route surveys as needed. The Breeding Bird Protocol, Data Forms, Quick Guides, Webinar Recordings, and other helpful training videos are all available on the Resource tab of the FSD website. Keep in mind that the 2023 webinars will not be available immediately, but you can find the 2022 recordings until then. Also check out the FL Shorebird Alliance website for additional resources about bird identification, Chick Age Guides, the monthly Rackline newsletter, and much more. And remember that you can always contact us anytime with questions about the protocol or data entry or the database at flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com.
So thank you all for attending this webinar and for continuing to make the Florida Shorebird Monitoring Program a success. There is a lot of new information to digest and we have quite a bit of time for questions. So again, feel free to use the chat box or raise your hand uh, if you wanna ask a question by turning on your mic. Um, now that the presentation's over and there shouldn't be any feedback, we're good to do that. All right, hi Whitney, I see your question in the chat is, who's the best person to contact if we need help while on a survey? Um, that depends on what kind of help you need. Um, so if it's just looking for assistance on how to survey, um, the best person to contact is your local partnership, or if you're surveying with a group of people, like a specific agency, to reach out to them and ask for help. Uh, they're going to know the area the best and, and be able to help you with that specific area. Um, if you don't know what your local partnership is, uh, you can check on the FSA's website, or you can tell me what county you're planning on surveying, and I can tell you which partnership you're probably going to be in. Um, you can also reach out to the regional shorebird biologist, and again, that information is in is on the help page of the FSD website. Nellis, okay, so that's the southwest region, which is Alexis Cardis for the regional shorebird biologist. So on this website, you can click on partnerships. Ah, yes, it is Sign Coast. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> that is this one. That is Holly Short and Beth Boreas. Thank you so much for coming. I, I greatly appreciate you guys uh, coming and seeing through to, to learn all about the Greenberg Protocol and data entry.